This is the first in a two-part video series discussing evidence for evolution. There's simply too much evidence for me to discuss it all in one video. So in, in this one, we'll discuss four of the categories for evidence of evolution, and then we'll deal with some different categories of evidence in the next video. So that'll be evidence for evolution part two. But uh, for starters, the first thing we need to talk about is the most common place to find evidence for this theory, which is the fossil record. Uh, species from today have similar species that are located in the fossil record. We could go over many examples of this. And, and one of the things I want you to understand from the video is that I usually try to show you like one or two examples of a concept. And it's certainly not an exhaustive representation. There are many, many things that will fall into this category. But uh, this one is actually something that comes right out of your textbook. And uh, you can see modern day species like the armadillo have an ancestral species that is no longer in existence on the planet, but we have fossil evidence to represent them. The thing that's interesting is the size difference here. Now, it doesn't give you any scale in the picture, but it says 200 kilograms for the ancient species and then only 4 kilograms for our armadillo. So we see that with a lot of species, there will be like uh, significant changes in size. So you think about like modern reptiles as opposed to their dinosaur ancestors, you know, some of which were extremely large. Um, but we're seeing general consistencies in their morphological structure, like in their body plans. You can very easily see that the armadillo is structurally similar to the uh, glyptodon, this uh, ancient species that it's currently derived from. Now, there are other forms of evidence that will support this. If you can get genetic evidence, uh, that's something else that kind of links modern and ancient species together. But we'll build on that in a later concept. But I just want you to understand that the fossil record shows us there are many ancient species that have very, very similar morphological structures to species that we're seeing in modern day. The flip side of that is the fossil record also shows us that some species on the planet have gone unchanged for millions of years. So some species are extremely successful in their environment, and because of that, they haven't really changed at all evolutionarily for a very long time. Uh, horseshoe crabs are a good example of this, as are some species like sharks that have been around for literally millions of years, and they've gone, for the most part, uh, genetically unchanged as far as evolution goes. Um, one of the other concepts that we're always looking for when it comes to the fossil record are things that are referred to as intermediate fossils. Uh, they're also some kind, sometimes discussed as what are called transitional fossils. People will commonly call them missing links. Uh, this is a good example of this. This is the fossil for Archaeopteryx, which is a link between what we see in modern birds and then their ancestors, which are actually reptiles, which are uh, dinosaurs. So the, uh, the modern-day descendants of the dinosaurs kind of branch off and they go in two directions. One direction is birds, the other direction are the modern reptiles that we see. Uh, what you can pick up pretty easily from this fossil is that this is very much of a, of a dinosaur fossil. We'll go over some of the structures of the head and neck that help support that in a moment. But you can see that the limbs are becoming somewhat more bird-like, and then you can very much see that this individual had feather-like structures. And uh, feathers are actually morphologically very similar to the scales that we see in reptiles. So feathers are actually just a modified scale structure. And they've been able to support this with genetic evidence as well. Uh, to give you a better picture for Archaeopteryx, we'll take a look at this image. And this is sort of tying together a dinosaur with Archaeopteryx, so our transitional species, and then a modern bird skeleton. This happens to be one of a chicken. You can see that there are certain features that they have in common. Uh, for starters, we're talking about like the structure of the head and neck. Very, very similar between the dinosaurs and Archaeopteryx. Um, one of the features that goes away, if we're looking at this carefully, dinosaur had sharp teeth. The modern-day bird species has no teeth. Archaeopteryx is somewhat in the middle. It has um, like small teeth-like structures. Um, it does have the reversed first toes, which we're seeing that as a consistent feature between all three of them. Uh, the three-clawed hand, 
that is something that's somewhat modified in Archaeopteryx and then basically gone in modern birds, even though they still have like the phalanges, like those small bones at the end, that's been fully incorporated into their wings. Uh, there are other features, like if we're seeing the, uh, the pubic bone is rotated backwards. Uh, that's something that we're seeing as a pretty consistent feature with all of these, the way the, the pubic bone lines up, um, as well as the reversed uh, knee joint. If you've ever looked at a bird carefully, say like held a, a parrot or a parakeet on your finger, they have very scaly legs. They lay eggs. You know, they have all of these features in common with reptiles. So birds are one of the two branches of uh, modern day descendants of some of our dinosaurs. So that pretty much uh, wraps up the main fossil evidence. The last thing to talk about here are two quick terms. The first one is derived traits. The idea with these is that uh, these are traits that are new. They're derived from some kind of a change in the environment. So if we think about our Archaeopteryx here for a second, it will have some derived traits, like the, um, the feathers that it's developing. Those are a derived trait because they're new. That's something that's different from its ancestral species. The flip side of derived traits are ancestral traits. So we went over some things that Archaeopteryx had in common with its ancestors. So it had that same head and neck structure, it had similar teeth, you know, it has similar lower limbs, uh, the way that their knee joint is established, the way that their feet are made. Even modern birds have ancestral traits that are in common with the dinosaurs, the idea of egg laying and the scaly skin. So those are our two uh, major groups. Again, derived traits are things that are new. Ancestral traits are things that we're inheriting from an ancestor. The next section of evidence for us to talk about goes a little bit quicker. Uh, these are referred to as homologous structures. Uh, if you remember when we talked about homologous pairs when we were going through and studying genetics, homologous means like same. So in this idea, homologous structures have the same or similar structures, even though limbs may have a different function. So this is an example of an image from your textbook that does a great job of breaking this down. If we look at the similarities between the human limb, the leg of a horse, the leg of a cat, uh, then we've got the forelimb of a porpoise, and then also the wing of a bat, if you notice Morphologically, they all follow the same general bone structure. There's one big bone in our upper arm, so for us this is our humerus. You've got two bones in your forearm, those are your radius and your ulna. You can feel those if you put your, your hand out, you're going to shake somebody's hand. You've got one bone clearly on the top, the other one on the bottom. Then you have the, uh, the metacarpals, the small bones in the back of the hand, and the phalanges, the end of the fingers. If you're looking at all of these other species, their bones follow the exact same pattern that our bones do. We've got one big bone in the upper limb, we've got two bones down in the forearm, and then the metacarpals and the phalanges at the end. The thing that changes is the proportions. Right? So the, uh, the proportions for us is basically almost the same length for the upper and lower limb, and then all of the smaller bones in the hand are very compact and like held together tightly because for us our hands are mostly functioning for dexterity whereas something like the porpoise where it's set up for swimming then the upper bones are actually much smaller in proportion to the phalanges and the ones that make up the end of their forelimbs because we think about them swimming through the water they need to be very flexible through the end whereas for us you know we need a strong pivot point at the elbow and at the shoulder and only really require flexibility at the end of the hand same kind of idea with the bat you know, the bat follows the same pattern that we do. Big bone in the upper arm, two bones in like the forelimb, and then their fingers are really what kind of extend through the end of their wings. And they do have the one little finger kind of protruding from the top. Uh, but the idea with homologous structures is you could apply this to any vertebrate. It doesn't have to be these five species. Um, but any vertebrate organism is going to have the same general body plan, which is part of the reason why we go through and dissect rats at the end of the curriculum in lab biology, because rats morphologically are very similar to people. They follow the same general body plan that we do. The proportions will be a little different, but all of the same you know, organs and organ systems are there. And uh, that's one of the ideas here. What this supports is the idea of a common ancestor. You know, all vertebrates are descended from one common individual 
because their general bone structure is the same. The functions of all these limbs are different, right? The bat's using this for flying, swimming, whereas these two are weight-supporting structures, and for us, it's mostly dexterity. But um, even though the, uh, the functions are different, the patterns for the bones are all the same, showing that we're all modified from one similar original organism. Our next section of evidence is similar to some of the things we saw with comparative anatomy and homologous structures, but these are referred to as vestigial structures. The idea behind something that's vestigial is that it's some kind of a reduced form of a functional structure that one of our ancestors had. Uh, for example, if we're looking at some of these concepts here, uh, we're seeing the pelvis in a snake. Uh, they do actually have a pelvic bone but it's attached going like uh, vertically with the, uh, the rest of the ribs. So it's not something that's functional in an organism without legs. If you think about your pelvis, that's really what connects your lower body to your upper body. Well, snakes don't have a lower body, right? Snakes don't have any of those lower limbs, but they're vertebrates. They have a backbone. They're descended from species that have a pelvis, that have lower limbs. So because of that, snakes have that vestigial bone that's evidence from one of their ancestors. It's sort of like leftover parts that we don't need, but it's something that you still have because you inherited it from an ancestral species. Uh, kiwis, which are small birds, uh, they live in New Zealand. They're too small to fly, their wings rather, are too small to be used for flying. Kiwis are like a, a running bird, but they still have these tiny vestigial wings on either side. So they're not helpful, they're not a flighted bird, but they still have those wings because it's something they inherited from their ancestors. Uh, we actually have one of these as well. We have an appendix, which is uh, a body structure that's descended from our ancestors. Uh, the idea behind this is that it used to be an important part of the digestive system before people started cooking their food. So if you're eating like undied, or uncooked uh, rather meat and things like that, the, uh, the coelom would be part of the digestive system that would help break that down. A lot of that has sort of shrunken into the modern day version of the appendix. Uh, it's still thought to have some benefit in that like helpful bacteria is kind of sequestered there in the appendix. So it's not completely useless but it's something that certainly doesn't fulfill its previous function. You know, since our diet now is vastly different than the diet of our ancestors, um, that's something that's become a vestigial structure for us. So again, these are just three examples. There are many things like this, but keep in mind what this is supporting is number one, the idea of a common ancestor. Since we're inheriting some of these parts that, uh, that species don't really need anymore. And then the second idea is that they are changing over time and their body plan is changing in such a way that fits their environment. The whole reason they have these leftover structures is their environment is different from that of their ancestors. The last one for us to talk about, and this one's really quick, uh, is the idea of analogous structures. The concept here is that even though they're used for the same purpose, they're not structurally the same. The thing to be careful with, this does not indicate a close evolutionary relationship. So we are not saying that these species are evolutionarily related. The idea with analogous structures is that we're seeing that they function the same way and evolved independently. A simple example of this is if we look at the eagle as a flighted species and then the bat as a flighted species. These two things are not evolutionarily related at all, at least not closely related. Um, the bat is a mammal and then the eagle is obviously a bird. So they're in two vastly different categories. I mean, if you go way, way back, they'll have a common ancestor, but they do not have anything um, very closely like, relating the two of them together. But if we look at them, they have very, very similar structures. Their wings follow the same general pattern. The reason for this is there is ju uh, generally one like efficient way for things to evolve, and most things in nature will follow the most efficient path. So even though these two structures evolved independently, like the bat evolved its wings far differently than the eagle evolved its wings, their structures are relatively similar because there's like one best way for flighted animals to have developed. 
And because evolution favors those best traits, all of the traits that weren't ideal, that weren't formed in this V-shape with the aerodynamic structure that the bat and the eagle have, all of those forms were not the ones that could compete the best, so they were slowly eliminated through the process of natural selection. So analogous structures very much supports this idea that nature has like one ideal way of most things functioning, and species like the bat and the bird that are not closely related evolution evolutionarily, uh, but still have a common function or a common feature, uh, they will sort of evolve in the same kind of pattern. So that's why we're seeing the same kind of wing structure in many flighted species, whether or not they're closely related. Uh, so this covers our first four areas of evolutionary evidence. We'll come back then tomorrow with a second group of evidence that supports the theory of evolution. Uh, thank you for watching, and make sure you answer the questions at the end of the video.